As you're out doing your Christmas shopping, going in and out of different stores, you'll likely hear Christmas carols being played over the intercoms and on the radio. You see, the world doesn't have a problem with a baby in a manger, but they need to understand that the baby we celebrate was born as our mediator and substitute. The incarnation is the miracle of Christmas. That's coming up next as Arkansas Live starts right now. You know, we spent uh, yesterday's program on looking into the Word and defining the incarnation because the incarnation, God becoming human, God becoming humankind, God becoming flesh. That revelation that incarnation is what is the miracle of Christmas. You, you know, some say the miracle of Christmas is uh, the baby in the manger, uh, the miraculous conception, the virgin birth. Yes, that is a miracle. That is a biological miracle. That's a spiritual miracle. miracle. But the, the real miracle is the fact that God became flesh. Jesus' life did not begin in the manger. Jesus' life did not begin at Bethlehem. He pre-existed with God before. He is the Word. He was in the beginning with God. According to Proverbs 8 and Philippians 2, 6 and 7, and we, we really went into that in detail yesterday. So today, I want to move on and talk about God in Christ united with man. Um, let me go back to Philippians 2, 6, and 7 it, real quickly for those of you that may have missed yesterday's broadcast. Uh, when, when it says Jesus being, it means that he already existed, but he was manifest in human form. He was the outward form, the express image of the Father, Hebrews chapter 1. He didn't think it was robbery. He didn't think it took away from his deity to become humanity. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. And he was made in the likeness of men. And all those scriptures that we read yesterday are all confirmed one of another in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word uh, be established. Now, let's look at the scriptural reference to this union, this uniting between God and man. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man uh, be in Christ, he's a new um, creature, old things passed away, uh, behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to witness that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Get this. I mean, those of you that have problems with your um, sinfulness, it says that God did not impute our trespasses unto us, but laid them on Jesus. Other scriptures support this. A woman caught in the act of adultery. Jesus said, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. It, he wasn't saying that the sin was okay. He wasn't justifying and giving his approval of the sin of adultery or any sin for that matter. He was just saying, I did not come to condemn you. I am not the condemner. Your conscience, your heart, the Bible says, is what condemns you. And it says that God is greater than your heart. You have an advocacy with the Father through Jesus Christ the righteous, the propitiation for our sins. If you sin, go to, the, to God the Father, confess your sin, repent of your sin. 
He's faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is all included in incarnation and redemption. We're, we're going we're to see these two together. Redemption is not possible without the incarnation. Now, now we're not talking about, <laughs> we're, I hate to make this clear, we're not talking about reincarnation. I, I, in the Navy, I served on two different ships and we had a, a, a young man who was an Asian young man serving in our U.S. military. And, and his name, it was so funny. I, I wasn't a Christian then, but I, I did notice the name. He had, we all had our names stenciled on our, on our khaki blues. And his, his name was Re-Incarnation. That was his name. Re, R-E, dash, incarnation. Well, you know, there is a doctrine of reincarnation. Indians, the, the people from India, they Hindus, they believe in reincarnation. If you've ever been over in that part of the world, which I have, you'll see the cows walking in the middle of the street and nobody bothers to do anything about it because that could be your great uncle <laughs> reincarnated. We're not talking about reincarnation. We're talking about the incarnation. We're talking about God becoming flesh. Jesus was the express image of the person of God. He was God in human form. He was God in the flesh. So uh, let's, let's get back to uh, <clears throat> reading our scripture in 2 Corinthians 5. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So God has come to reconcile us to himself. Now listen to this. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God through Christ. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Remember, he was tempted in every point like we are yet without sin. Jesus was not a sinner. He didn't become a sinner. He became sin. He was our sin substitute. There's only one way or two ways that God showed me that Jesus could have become a sinner. Because I heard a minister say that one time. I heard him say Jesus became a sinner. I said, no, 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 that is not correct. And God said, there's only two ways he could have become a sinner. One, he would have had to have been born of man, which he wasn't. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost. He was not conceived by Joseph. Every man born after Adam was born spiritually dead, separated from God. So Jesus wasn't born of a man. And two, he would have had to have sinned. And he never sinned. The Bible says he was tempted in every point like we are, yet but without sin. So Jesus didn't become a sinner. He became our sin substitute. He took upon himself that which belonged to us. He, 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 wasn't, he didn't do anything to deserve any of this. He, did, he took what we deserved. He made, God made Jesus to become sin for us. Get this. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So in Christ Jesus, my profession, my faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God raised him from the dead, when I believe that in my heart and say that out of my mouth, I am made right with God through my faith in Christ. So I have become united with God as a man through Christ, through Christ's substitutionary sacrifice and my recognition and believing that and confessing that, I partake of his righteousness. It's not my righteousness. It's his righteousness. But it becomes mine. I become righteous, made right with God. No condemnation, no fear, uh, no judgment. I'm not afraid of God. I'm not fearful of God. 
because I've been made right with him through Jesus Christ. This is all due to the incarnation. Now, let's, let's look at another scripture. Let's go over to 1 Timothy and let's look at chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, let me make this statement concerning that verse. The incarnation, Jesus was equal with God on the one hand, but united with man on the other. This is the, the miracle of Christmas. This is the incarnation. This is uh, the God-man. Jesus was all God and he was all man. As both God and man, he became the mediator between the two. He was the only true solution for fallen man. Since we all died in Adam, since we were all enslaved in sin because of Adam's transgression, there had to be another man just like the first man to redeem man. Ooh, <laughs> I know some of you lost me there. Go over to 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 15, verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Well, what do you mean, last Adam, Pastor? Who are you talking about? Jesus. Now, notice it didn't say the second Adam. It said the last Adam. The first Adam, Genesis chapter 1, and the last Adam, Jesus. So the first Adam was a living soul. The last Adam was a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, a lot of times people get these, these phrases confused and mixed up, and, and they talk about, um, they, they don't separate Adam and man. It, the Bible makes it very clear. The first Adam and the last Adam. There's, there's a reason for this. Adam in his creation was made in the likeness of God. God said, let's make man in our image. He named him Adam or Adam. So Adam was, was made in the likeness image of God. Jesus was the last Adam. There will never be another one. No need for another one because Jesus redeemed us from Adam's transgression. So the last Adam is a life-giving or a quickening spirit. Everything that we lost in the first Adam we got back in the last Adam. But notice he refers to the man, the man that was created. The first man was natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Again, referring to the incarnation. Jesus was the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now you study that out and it will bless you. So the incarnation, Jesus was equal with God on the one hand and united with man on the other, both God and man. He became the mediator between the two. He was the only true solution for fallen man. Redemption 
could not be possible without the incarnation. Because if you go back to chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, let's look at verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So humanity, mankind, died or was separated from God through Adam's sin. Death, death, physical death, was not God's idea. Physical death was never in God's plan. Adam is the one that opened up the door to physical death. Through Adam, we all die physically. In Christ, we're all made alive spiritually. We're also going to see the redemption or the raising or the resurrection of our physical bodies. But the real you never dies. The real you is the spirit man. The physical body dies, but the spirit man, which is made in the image and likeness of God, never dies. That ought to make a difference in you when you're looking towards the end of your life or the death of a loved one. They're still living. They're just not living in that body anymore. So when you are celebrating the life of a loved one, a friend or whatever, you don't need to allow any grief. Uh, over in Thessalonians, it says we're not to sorrow as those who, you know, have no hope because we know where mama is and daddy is and my wife and my husband, my babies, my kids, my aunt, uncle, we know where they all are. If they were born again, they're in heaven with God. We're just taking care of that physical body because that physical body has returned to the dirt, to the earth from which it was created, that it may be raised on the day of resurrection. In Christ, we're all made alive. He says in verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, physical death. There, there'll come a day where there'll be no more dying. No more, no more death at all because Jesus has redeemed us. Jesus in Revelation, remember in the first chapter, he said, I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He's, he's overcome it. In fact, he says uh, further over in uh, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, he says, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? He, he through his death, burial, and resurrection from the incarnation, him being God in the flesh, he has redeemed us from that. Redemption is not possible without the incarnation. The incarnation, which is the miracle of Christmas, which we celebrate, but I doubt very seriously how many people really know what the incarnation is. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Hebrews 9, 14, and let's read verse 14 through 16. Um, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. In other words, if you just take your modern day will, you can make a will, you can make a, you know, a living trust or whatever, however, you know, you want to structure your last will and testament. You can make that will, but it cannot be enforced or activated. Um, it, it cannot be probated. It cannot take action, carried out, until after you die. Well, look at what Jesus did. 
He had a will. Here, I'm reading to you out of his will. Last will and testament of Jesus Christ. This was his will. The New Testament is his will. And Jesus left a will to us, <laughs> but Jesus went, <laughs> Jesus went one step further than we go because he died and then he was raised from the dead and came back to life to probate his own will, to make sure that his will was carried out properly. And he sent the Holy Spirit to enforce it. Now, once we begin to see clearly how powerful this incarnation is, there won't be any more doubt and fear and anxiety and worry and fretfulness. No. Jesus is God in the flesh. He left us his will. This is, this is what he wanted. Remember when the, when the leper said to Jesus in Mark 1:40, he said, if you will, you can heal me. What did Jesus say? I will read the will. It is God's will for you to be healed, delivered, set free, saved. There are a lot of people that will never be saved. A lot of people won't ever be healed, delivered, whatever. But that doesn't change the will. You know, if you, in, the, in the natural, if you, somebody dies and you have a reading of the will, the will is set. But if you want to find out about it, you have to attend. You have to go. You have to be notified. You ever see in the paper, I don't know if they still do this or not, but once a year they used to publish all the money that was left unclaimed through whatever series of events. And there were people that, that had money owed to them or left to them or uh, was going to be rebated or returned to them. And they published their names in the paper so they could claim what belonged to them. They never showed up. They never knew about it. How many Christians do you think don't know about this and therefore they can't claim it. They don't all, uh, all Christmas is to them is presents and a tree and, and an office party and, and uh, a baby Jesus in a manger. I, <laughs> on my way home from work, <laughs> I, I see these and I, and I'm, I'm glad they're putting up these lights and ornaments and stuff. And I saw this one home and they had a, they had an inflatable, uh, Santa and reindeer and sleigh. And I mean, it was a big, big deal. Had it all lighted. And, and this year they added the manger scene to it. And previous years they didn't have the manger scene, which makes me wonder if maybe they got saved and they wanted to honor Jesus. And so they wanted to celebrate the birth of Jesus uh, in the manger. So they have a manger scene and it's all lit up. So when you drive past their house, you see the manger and Santa Claus. I guess, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the people, don't, not judging them, but I'm just going by what's in the front yard. I guess, they don't, I guess they're going to celebrate both, the birth of Jesus and Santa Claus. <laughs> and I don't mean to be critical or ugly or bah humbug, but there, there's no such person as Santa Claus. Oh, I know people go back to the history and they get all the historical records of a quote Santa Claus, but what Santa Claus has become, there is no such person. There's no such thing. And people worship at the foot of, of Santa Claus, a big jolly fellow with a white beard and a red nose and a stocking cap and so forth. And so I guess these people, they don't want to get, they don't want to let go of the Santa Claus, but they maybe want to include Jesus because I guess maybe they think the season is about both. Well, we've made it about Santa Claus, but it's really about the incarnation. It's about Jesus. So you've got to make up your mind. What are you celebrating? Are you celebrating the incarnation? Are you celebrating God becoming flesh? Are you celebrating the gift of Jesus? Or are you celebrating a fictitious character called Santa Claus? <laughs> I've told you this story before. My wife doesn't like me to tell this, but I think I was probably 10 years old. I'm almost embarrassed to say this. I was probably 10 years old before my mother told me there was no Santa Claus. I walked in the house one day and she was wrapping presents on the dining room table. 
I said, Mama, what are you doing? She said, Bubba, it's about time you learn there's no such person as Santa Claus. Oh, <laughs> shock. I was, my world was shattered. And for years, I didn't, I didn't have a good attitude towards Christmas because I thought, you know, they've been lying to me all these years about Santa Claus. I bet there's no Easter Bunny either. You know, <laughs> you realize you've been lied to and you have been celebrating something that is fictitious, has no substance to it whatsoever. But then when I got saved, aha, then I realized what Christmas was all about. I became awestruck. And of course, when I was a kid, every year you could go to the state capitol and, and the manger scene was on the front steps of the state capitol. And when you would go up there during Christmas, there were cars parked everywhere. There were crowds, hundreds of people coming and going to see the manger scene because Jesus was more preeminent in those days. We didn't have separation of church and of state myth. We didn't have politicians and ACLUs that were, you know, acting out their frustrations. Everybody believed and we all went down to the state capitol. That was the, that was part of the Christmas uh, tour, if you please. At least it was in our family. Well, now, you know, they still have the manger scene on the state capitol grounds, but it's over to the side. It's not up on the capitol steps. It's not the main attraction. So you have to decide. Are you going to celebrate the incarnation? Or are you going to celebrate commercialization? Well, redemption is not possible without the incarnation. Now, tomorrow we'll read, in addition to Hebrews 9, 14 through 16, we'll read Luke 1, 30 through 35, which is the, the story, the Christmas story, if you please. Not, not all through the house and not a creature was stirring. No, not that story. But the story about the shepherds watching over their flock and how the angel appeared to Mary and told her, that she was going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit and Jesus would be born of her. That's the real story. And the incarnation produced a union between God and man that is so complete and now we're born of God. So join me for tomorrow's broadcast. Remember Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell.